It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Robert S. Kerr, United States Senator from Oklahoma. Senator Kerr, it's a pleasure to have you with us again, sir, on the Chronoscope. Our viewers, of course, uh, know that you're one of those old-fashioned Democrats in the Indian country. <laughs> uh, who get your tomahawk out every now and then. And I just wonder if there's somebody down in Washington you're gunning for now, sir. Well, Mr. Huey, I'm very much opposed to what the Secretary of Agriculture is doing to agriculture in this country. Well, now, what's, what's, your, what's your case against Mr. Benson, sir? My case against Mr. Benson is that while he is fiddling and, and talking about... Uh, 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 things which have no connection with reality, the producers of beef in this country are gradually being squeezed into bankruptcy. Well now, obviously, I mean, you're not objective about this. You come from one of the great cattle producing states, don't you? Yes, I do. And are your cattlemen uh, putting the heat on you to put the heat on Mr. Benson? Well, the, the, the cattlemen are saying this, uh, that the price of their product is below the cost of production that if it continues, they're going to go into bankruptcy. When they do, uh, they've suffered a great loss, and the consumer population of the country uh, will find that they likewise have had inflicted upon them a tragedy. How much has uh, the price of beef been reduced from the, their level, from the level of the cattlemen themselves? I mean, well, the price, of, the price of beef on the hoof has gone down in the last 12 months 50%. How much has it gone down at the markets where you buy the meat? Uh, at the, in the meat market, mm -hmm. uh, it had gone down very little until the first of the year. I'd say it has since gone down uh, probably half as much as the price has been forced down to the producer. Now, Senator, you're, you're stating to our viewers as a matter of fact that the beef industry, the beef producers, are really in trouble, that they are going bankrupt if something isn't done. That's very definite. How much of a subsidy do you think they should get to keep them from going bankrupt? Uh, 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 Mr. Burt, they don't want a subsidy. Uh, they want uh, an opportunity to produce at a reasonable profit. You see, we have a program of supports in with reference to basic commodities. The Secretary of Agriculture has the authority to support perishables of many kind at 90% of parity. And the average cattleman feels that since the price of beef on the hoof has gone down now to less than 80% of parity, that the secretary should use the authority which he now has under the law and support that product at what the law uh, permits him to do. Isn't that just a matter of labels, uh, Senator, not calling it a subsidy? In effect, it is a subsidy. The government's giving them money. No, no, uh, not at all. If, uh, if he would move to do that, <coughs> he wouldn't have to buy a lot of beef, uh, in my judgment. But it would still be, if you bought even a dollar's worth, it would be a dollar's worth of subsidy. Well, it would be a dollar's worth of <coughs> investment in the welfare of one great segment of our country and in well, the continuation well, uh, of a supply. Uh, I know that ag agriculture represents a very great industry in this country, but so does the clothing industry and so does uh, the automobile industry. Why should agriculture have any more right to a subsidy which the taxpayer pays than the clothing industry or the automobile industry? Because the consumer has an equal interest in an abundant supply of food and fiber as does the producer. You see, the only way that the consumer can have an abundant supply of food uh, uh, at a reasonable price is for somebody to produce it. If economics are handled in a way to force the producer back onto the law of supply and demand, all he'll do is just retreat in the matter of production, produce less food, and get more money for it. Well, I gather you don't believe in free enterprise, particularly <coughs> so far as the farmers are concerned. Sure, I believe in free enterprise, but I don't believe in the law of the jungle. Senator Kerr, our viewers have heard a great deal of discussion about this in, in the last few days. And now, sir, to simplify, 
The, Mr. Benson is buying butter, is supporting the price of butter at 90% parity, isn't he? Yes, sir. And that means that the government buys butter and supports the price. And you are saying, in effect, that you'd like to see him do the same thing for beef. Yes, only there's this difference. Uh, in supporting the price of butter, which is in great overproduction, uh, he's uh, accumulated probably two million pounds of butter. I think there's many things that this country could do with that butter that would make it a good investment, but that's another question. I think if he moved to support the price of beef, that it would result in the, in the packers paying an amount equal to 90% of parity, and I don't think it would raise the cost at the meat market a penny. <laughs> and you're telling our, our, our viewers that unless that is done, that, they are, that the beef producing industry is going to be hurt and hurt bad. That is correct. The and average beef producer is going to continue to produce at a loss until he's broke, and that's going to mean that the producers are going to gradually be going out of the market. In one or two years, the supply will be less, and then the consumer will be penalized by having to pay more for less beef. Senator, and what did you think of uh, this two-day supply for the whole country of New Zealand beef coming over and selling at 35 cents a pound? from New Zealand. That re ha recently happened, you know. Do you think that was a uh, good thing for the cattlemen or a bad thing? Were you opposed to these imports of beef? Well, yes, I'm opposed uh, to the imports of beef uh, when we have competitive, unsupported, uh, similar products. Hmm. Now, if, if the secretary had moved to put a support program under the price of beef, then when imports imperiled the price of beef, he could have moved to curtail imports. Well, but until he moves to support the price of the domestic product under the law in which he operates, he can't move to curtail imports of a competitive product. Well, that brings us to the to the second your second major interest, I believe, in Congress, sir, uh, which you are interested <laughs> in the reciprocal trade agreements and in foreign trade. That's correct, isn't it? I am keenly interested in reciprocal trade. Well, now, does that mean that you are in favor of what our viewers have heard a lot of discussion about? You believe in trade, not aid. Uh, I believe in, in the promotion of trade to the greatest possible extent for the mutual welfare, both of the buyer and the seller, which is our country and our customers. Do you believe in the lowering of tariff barriers? Uh, where, uh, on a reciprocal basis, <coughs> it promotes uh, a greater trade between those that make the adjustment. And that that, much, would, that uh, would go for uh, cattle, too, you, you would beef, too? I mean, if there were any bar barriers against beef, you were against the importation of beef. Uh, just now, I'm against the importation of beef when it uh, when it tends mm. to add to the destruction of an unsupported domestic uh, agricultural product. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, that's correct. How much How much are we selling abroad now, sir? Uh, uh, we're selling at this time better than fifteen billion dollars of American products per year. And how much are we buying? We're buying about nine billion dollars. So there's about six billion dollars there that we have to make up one way or the other. Have Either to make it up with gifts or loans. And you are in favor of making it up by buying an addition. I'm in six favor of making it up by creating an environment that will result in our buying enough to offset what we sell. I think it's far better to increase our trade rather than our aid. Well, you're a supporter of President Eisenhower in this because I think he believes the same thing, doesn't he? He does. Yes. I see. yes. Well, now, do you concede, sir, that there will be some segments <coughs> of American industry or American producers who will be hurt by our buying an additional $6 billion worth of foreign-made goods? There will be times when it will hurt some domestic industry, and when the time comes that the damage to a domestic industry is greater than the overall good, uh, then I would favor a readjustment. You think that the national welfare, however, uh, the, is so important and that it overrides those... those yes, that, uh, I do, because you see the economic strength and the, and the power of our allies to, to defend themselves and help us in the common cause are all tied up in the strength of their economy, which is dependent on their trade, mostly with us. I don't suppose you've ever made any studies, sir, of exactly... Uh, what tariffs on what industry should be reduced or lowered? Well, uh, I, I have, but it is such an endless compilation of figures that I'd get lost and, and we'd all be terribly confused if we went into those details in a very few well, minutes. Senator, our viewers will recall, sir, that you were one of the, uh, were a candidate for the Democratic nomination last year. Well, well that's very kind if they recall <laughs> that. I, I had uh, thought you made such a little impression will you, that... <laughs> will you be a candidate four years from now, do you think, Senator? I have no plan at this time to be a candidate anything uh, other than re-election to the Senate from Oklahoma. Well, you, you're, of course, a very influential member of the Democratic Policy Committee in the United States Senate. 
Now, Thank sir, uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson, I believe, is on a trip around the world. So I'd like to ask you this. Uh, who's making policy for the Democratic Party now? Is it Stevenson or is it the, the, the policy committee in the Senate? Well, I would, uh, I would not say that it's exclusively either. Mr. Stevenson is the titular head of the Democratic Party. Do you think he should run four years from now? If he wants to. Uh, but uh, the policy of the party is being made more by the membership of the National Congress today than by anybody else. Well, sir, as a, as a final question, our viewers will also recall that you were very outspoken on the Korean War. And uh, what do you think of uh, Senator Taft's uh, proposal for a general investigation of the Korean War? Well, I think Senator Taft spoke before he thought. I think he's trying to be a general again. I, I think that uh, we've got a great defense department. I think that uh, I didn't support Eisenhower, but certainly he's a great general. And I think he's in better shape to determine that than Taft is. I, I've just got more confidence in the general we've got in the White House than I have in any of the generals we've got in the Senate. Well, Senator Kerr, I'm sure that our viewers very much appreciated these outspoken sentiments of yours, and thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you. And the opinions, as you've heard our speakers express tonight, have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was... Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Robert S. Kerr, United States Senator from Oklahoma. Confidence, said William Pitt, is a plant of slow growth. Now, confidence in Longine watches has been growing slowly, but very solidly for almost a century. But without a doubt, the confidence of others in Longines has been stimulated by the confidence of Longines in itself. Yes, the makers of Longines watches have been ever willing to compete with the finest watches of the world. And from such competitions at world's fairs and international expositions, and in the observatory timing contests, Longines watches have won countless prizes, awards, and medals. Now, a Longines watch brings you more than the delight of a beautiful possession, more than the unsurpassed timekeeping of a remarkable watch. You have the confidence of knowing that you own the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of all the world. For Easter, for an anniversary, a birthday, or for any important gift occasion, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines with Norwatch. Tuesday Night Thrills, Danger, on the CBS Television Network. Stop washing your nylon. This is the CBS Television Network.